All right, well, good morning. It's um, nice to be back here in Hobart. Thanks to all of you for coming. So I'm John. I'm here to talk about the kernel. As is my want, I'll start by getting into what we have done over the course of the last year. The 4.4 kernel came out almost exactly a year ago in mid-January of 2016. Since then, we've had five regular releases to come out on pretty much, at this point, the regular 63 or 70 day release cycle. There was a period of time where the period, the period it took to create a kernel release was shrinking. I think we've actually bottomed that out at this point. We're not going to get much shorter than this. Nine or 10 weeks seems to be about what it takes to merge all the changes, get them tested and out there in some sort of a reasonable form. So each of these releases, as you can see, has been pretty busy. We've generally had on the order of 1,600 developers participating in each one of them. And we merge at least 12,000 change sets, sometimes quite a bit more. The 4.9 kernel released back in December was, in fact, the busiest development cycle that we've ever seen in the history of the kernel project, with over 16,000 changes being merged. I think that's a record that will probably hold for a little while. I don't think we'll see another one that busy for a bit. You can extend this forward to 4.10, which is due in the middle of February, if all goes well, and it pretty much should. And we can see it's not going to live up to 4.9, of course, in terms of volume of change, that sort of thing. But by the time it's done, we'll have seen the usual solid 1,600 developers, 12,000 change sets. It'll be just another fairly normal kernel release. Over the course of the year, if you add it all up, We've had 4,000 developers participating in the, in the project over the course of one year. That's a lot of people all merging code into the kernel over, over the course of just one year, and they've merged over 79,000 changes during this time. So the kernel remains a busy place. There's a lot going on, and I don't really see that changing anytime soon, despite Andrew Morton's famous claim once that we had to finish this thing someday. <laughs> um, that's going to be some other day. So, and you can see that the developer counts seem to be continuing to increase. We're, we seem to have a healthy community. But you, you always wonder if, if your community will stay healthy in the long term, if you're bringing in new developers to replace the people who get tired of it, whatever. So one way to look at this is just to look at the number of developers we've had. So the upper line plots the number of developers participating in each release cycle. This is since 3.0. So this is about five years worth of data, but the line extends a lot further back in time if you do that. So the trend is pretty clear. We've got a solid upward sort of trend. I'm often more amused instead by this other line here. That one is the number of first-time developers showing up in each development cycle. The number of people who contributed to that kernel who we had never seen before in the, in the history of the kernel project. It seems to be a fundamental constant of kernel development that each kernel release involves the work of about 200 new developers. This, this is extended back pretty much constantly over time. It doesn't seem to depend on the, the size of the release cycle or how long it takes or anything like that. If we release a kernel, we have the work of about 200 new developers in it. So as long as that continues, and as long as some of those people stay around, and some of them generally do, I think that we will continue to, to have a healthy development community with um, no shortage of, of work going into the kernel which is good because we have a lot to keep up with. So in terms of what's changing the development community, one say that not much is happening. It's really, it's kind of boring, honestly. This is the same story I've been telling for a while. We turn out kernels on a regular basis, a lot of stuff going in. It's, it's a fairly smoothly run, running machine. It module a few concerns about um, review in particular. The, the limiting factor in an awful lot of free software projects, not just the kernel, is not cr the creation of code, but the review of the code. And that's, that's where things bog down. And the kernel is no exception there. And we see subsystems sometimes that have, have critical review shortages and stuff don't, doesn't get in. There's been some complaints in the memory management area recently, for example. This is code that has to be reviewed quite heavily um, because the, the stakes are very high. And it's just hard to find the people to review it. So th this is an ongoing problem. It's, I don't know how we're going to solve it. And again, it's not unique to the kernel in any way. But for the most part, it's working well. But what I want to do is I want to talk about a few of the areas that are perhaps a little bit less boring, where we have challenges that we're going to have to, to face. And so one that I've been talking about for a while, and you're going to have to hear me babble on about it again, is the area of security. Because in a very real sense, this hasn't gotten better. 
I made this slide in September, actually. Um, I went to update it and figured out that actually I didn't really need to because I didn't have room anyway. And, um, and I think it gets the point across. We have a lot of vulnerabilities in the kernel, lots of, of defects that are considered severe enough to warrant a CVE number, something that needs to be tracked and fixed. Now, the kernel is always going to have more of these than many other projects, partly just due to the pace of its development. If you're merging 79,000 changes in a year, some of those changes are going to have problems. There's just no way around that. And the setting of the kernel is such that a lot of things that are just bugs and a lot of other user space type applications turn into vulnerabilities in the kernel. So we're always going to have a lot of them. But I don't think that necessarily justifies this, right? We have a lot of these. But the problem that I want to talk about today isn't really the number of vulnerabilities, but our response to them. We have a well-tuned algorithm for dealing with vulnerabilities. We've had this since really before Linux even existed. Right? Somebody finds a vulnerability, well, you run around, you make a patch, you ship it, and everybody is, is happy again, vulnerability fixed. And that's kind of what we've done for a long time. It's what we're doing now. But it, um, it has some issues. I don't know if Australia has the, the um, arcade game called Whack-A-Mole. In Whack-A-Mole, you have this nice big hammer, and the moles pop up through the holes, and you bash them down as they pop up. And it's, it's very satisfying, wham! You really show those moles who the boss is, right? You bash them right down and they're gone. Except that after a little while you notice that the moles keep on coming. In fact, they keep coming faster and you keep bashing and in the end the moles win, right? Fixing security vulnerabilities when they pop up is a game of whack-a-mole. And um, the moles are going to keep on coming and we're really not going to change that anytime in the near future, I don't think. But there's another aspect of this, this algorithm here, the second part, where distributors ship an update. Every now and then you see a message like this. This is something Greg Crow Hartman put up a, a few months ago, saying that he had found a bug in the 310 kernel, put it out in an update, and then discovered that the Nexus phones hadn't, fixed it, hadn't picked that fix up until he actually personally harangued somebody six months later to get that into a, an Android update for the Nexus phones. That was, he said, a six-month window where anybody could have gotten root on, on your phone easily. This story is not a one-time thing. I mean, sometimes we're faster. It only took about two months to ship the update for the dirty cow vulnerability, right? A huge vulnerability, well known, well exploited, and it still took two months on the Nexus phones. And these are the mobile embedded devices really with the best security story of just about anything that is out there. Almost everything else is worse than this. There's hundreds of millions, if not billions, of devices that are not getting updates at all. So this whole part about distributors shipping an update, this, this is broken down, I think, in a great part of our ecosystem here. It was something that worked fairly well in the, say, early 90s desktop era. It's, it's not working very well now. Um, a few years ago, I went and I visited the Republic of San Marino. It's a weird little country buried deep inside of Italy. And I was just sort of standing there reflecting on their approach to security, which involved finding the highest spot you can find and then build a bunch of tall walls on top of it. And you sit there, and nobody can really touch you. And in fact, it worked well for them to the point that San Marino is an independent country, even as all of Italy unified around it. But as I was standing there looking at this, I realized that this sort of defense really only works in settings where people don't fly. My, and not just my contention, is that our defenses that we have are somewhat analogous to these, these stone walls at this point. They worked once upon a time to a fair extent. They defended us against a lot of script kitties once upon a time. But they are not really suitable to, what, to the environment that we are facing now. Because the simple fact is that vulnerabilities will always be with us. Even if we could fix them all, we would have problems, but we can't. They are not being fixed. So we have to focus instead on something else, which is eliminating exploits. We need to get to a situation where even when vulnerabilities are found, they are not exploitable. They cannot be used by an attacker to take control of our systems. This is something that the security people have been saying for quite a long time. It's been a very hard message to sell in the kernel community for quite a long time. But the, the good news is that things have gotten a little bit better. This, 
I don't really have the time to go into these in detail, but we got post init read-only memory in 4.6, making it harder to, for an attacker to change some kernel data, very small amount of it at this point, but that should get better. We're seeing, we finally got the infrastructure to use the GCC plugin mechanism. So you can put plugins into the compiler that will transform the kernel code as the kernel is being built to make it more secure. Can do things like permute the order of the fields in a structure so that an attacker doesn't know how the structure is laid out in memory. And various other things like that. There's a lot of interesting tricks that can be played to make the kernel more resistant to attacks without actually changing the code. We're not using any plugins to any effect right now, but there's a number of them that are being prepared, and I expect we'll see them merged within the course of this year. And then we may see distributors starting to actually use these plugins to create harder to exploit kernels. In 4.9, we got a reworking of how kernel stacks are handled, closed up a major source of vulnerabilities, uh, kernel stack overflows. That's one of the more important security patches that has gone in over the course of the last year, in my opinion. Um, the functions that copy data between user space and the kernel have been hardened so they can do various sorts of sanity checks, make sure that, say, data coming into the kernel doesn't overrun the object it's being copied into, so that even if kernel code can be confused and made to copy a larger array of data than it really should be, this stuff will catch it and, and prevent that from happening. 4.10 sees some linked list hardening stuff that went in to detect linked list corruption and, and stop the show if that happens. Um, there's other patches out there for things like reference count hardening. There's a whole class of exploits that, have, that are based on overflowing reference counts and generally creating a use after free sort of vulnerability. So those patches, those ones are a little bit um, harder to get in for a reason that I will get into in a moment. They have performance sorts of implications and so on. But there's a lot of stuff going on, this and more. A lot of this comes out of the GR security patch set. Credit should be given for that where it's due because these folks did this a long time ago. They um, do not always interface well with the kernel development community, so it's taken a long time to get this stuff in. But people are working on reworking this code to make it acceptable for inclusion, and a lot of it is, is going upstream. So our security story is slowly getting better, and this, this is a very good thing. It's something that we've needed to do for a long time. There is, of course, a catch, and the, the real problem with a lot of this is that security-related code has trade-offs in particular in the form of performance costs and possible user space visible API behavioral changes. Kernel developers often work in a setting where a tenth of a percent speed regression is something that they really will fight hard against. A lot of these security related patches can have a cost that is rather higher than that. So that tends to create a lot of resistance to the merging of security related changes especially since certain kernel developers, let's say, have a fairly narrow view of what their job is. And it's very much oriented towards performance and making things work as fast as can. And they tend to see this the way the rest of us see the security lines at the airport as being kind of theatrical and not necessarily useful, that sort of thing. So convincing people to accept this stuff has been hard. Convincing people that we may actually have to pay a real cost for security is, is hard. But um, we need to do it. And I think that that battle is slowly being won. And we're starting to see more of this stuff going in so that you can at least enable it, even if they will turn off on their own personal systems. So hopefully our story is getting better there. Totally different area is um, an area of hardware change known as persistent memory. Persistent memory being an awful lot like ordinary processor memory, except that it, one, tends to be huge, and two, doesn't forget its contents when you turn the machine off. So there's a whole lot of interesting things that are going to result from this, in my mind, a lot of interesting applications. We're going to have to figure out how it is that we use this sort of stuff. But what I want to mention here is that persistent memory runs afoul of a number of the assumptions that are core to how Linux and the Unix systems before it were designed many, many years ago. Much of what we have in our core kernel is designed around the idea that I.O. is devastatingly slow and must be avoided at all costs. Right? Anytime you have to go out to storage, then you've lost in, in your performance world because something that's in memory can be accessed many orders of magnitude faster than something that's on storage. 
So we have things like the page cache, which is all there simply to avoid file I.O. completely whenever possible, or at least to defer it. Um, the avoidance of, of techniques like swapping, lots of other caches in the system, and so on, all designed around the avoidance of, of I.O. because our storage is slow. But now storage is not slow anymore. And that changes a lot of things here. So just to see this in action, if you type free on your system, you see something that looks a lot like this. I took a couple of columns out to make it fit. This was just run on a simple web server machine. It has um, eight gigabytes of memory installed in there. And if you look at it, of those eight gigabytes of memory, seven of them are being used for the page cache. All right? So almost the entire memory on the system is being used to, to cache the, the data that's in storage. But if the storage is directly accessible, as if it were memory, and nearly as fast, then this is wasted memory. And in fact, the, the effort of copying it back and forth is, is also wasted. So you really don't want to do that anymore. This, this whole page cache mechanism that we have is not necessarily useful. So we're having to address that. If you're interested in that, uh, Willie's talk in the next session, in the next room, we'll go into some details on that. Um, I plan to be there. But beyond this, the system has half a gigabyte of swap configured on it. And for all practical purposes, zero pages of that swap are actually being used. Right? The system is not using the swap at all. This is probably not an optimal setup, even if the system had slow rotating storage, which it does not. Because you know, most of the memory is in use somewhere. There's not that much free. Some of that memory is certainly not containing anything that's being accessed by anybody, and we'd be better off pushed out of the system. Even more so, though, if, once again, swap is nearly as fast as your main memory. So we have to rethink how we do that sort of stuff. So there's a lot that we have to do, including addressing performance bottlenecks. One of the reasons we don't swap much is that swap itself is very slow, regardless of the speed of the storage. There's a lot of lock contention and so on that nobody bothered to optimize because swap itself was so painful that the system tried not to use it at all. So we have to fix that. We have to fix little things like dealing with memory in four kilobyte chunks, which worked fairly well when we measured our total memory in megabytes. It is a little bit harder to do when our memory is measured in terabytes. Um, allow bypassing of caches and that sort of thing, going around the page cache completely. Um, stuff that is being done has been done in the kernel over the course of the last couple of years or so. Or simply bypassing the kernel altogether. There are, there are users out there who simply want to map all that persistent memory into their address space, get the kernel out of the way entirely. Sometimes that's the right thing to do, but sometimes that's indicative of the kernel not really doing what it needs to do in a way that's sufficiently performant that people are willing to make use of it. So we're going to have to figure this stuff out over the course of the next few years. And how how to make our kernel work with a different set of assumptions, because the hardware that we're running on has changed quite a bit. I mentioned bypassing the kernel. I want to talk about it in a bit of a different context here. You know, in our typical model of, of a Linux system, you've got all your applications. They go through the kernel to get to things like devices, network interfaces, and so on. Everything is mediated through the kernel. Sometimes people want to go around it, typically for performance purposes. So for example, you will often see people in very specialized settings running user space networking stacks to bypass the kernel's networking stack because they have one very specific thing they want to do and they don't need the generality that we provide and they think they can get it faster this way. So I'm going to talk about networking bypass, but not a performance-oriented one, a very different sort of thing in the form of a patch set that's called Transport over UDP, or TOU. This is a patch set that's out there. It has not been merged. It's in fact, run into trouble for reasons I'll get into. But um, it is an issue that we're going to run into. The idea behind Transport over UDP is that rather than using a transport level protocol on the wire, like TCP typically, you send unreliable datagrams. You use UDP, which is a lower level protocol. And then you hide your transport layer protocol headers and so on inside the UDP packet so that the, the network between you and the other end doesn't see it. It's only seen on the endpoints. That sort of thing. The network thinks you're just sending UDP, but you have actually implemented a reliable stream protocol on top of it, just burying it all within the, 
the UDP packets. This allows you to do a number of things, including implementing the transport level protocol in user space. So that you can now have your transport layer network stack, say, buried within your, your social media app or something like that. And there are reasons why people want to do this. Um, mostly having to do not with performance, because this is not really a performance enhancing thing, but instead with getting access to things like network protocol enhancements. Some years ago, six years ago about, the kernel gained support for an enhancement called TCP fast open. That just removes one, one packet from the three packet handshake that you need to use to set up a TCP connection. Makes it a little bit faster, reduces the latency of new connections. It's very much of interest to sites like Google, which is where that code came from in the first place, and other places doing a lot of connections. So nice sort of thing. We supported it in Linux, again, for about six years. So all of the big web companies, the big sites out there, support it just fine. But it's still not really being used. And the reason why it's not being used is that we're all running Android and Windows and Mac OS and whatever. And they all have ancient networking stacks, and they don't yet support this. So this is a story that's, that plays out over and over again. We improve the network protocols. But the protocols that you see on the net don't really change because the software isn't changing. This has become a real problem. It's called protocol ossification. And there's a couple of reasons for it, this being one of them. So if you can put your own protocol implementation, say, in, say, your Facebook app, then you get around this sort of thing. So this is why, this is the driving force behind this kind of work, is to be able to actually evolve the networking protocols again. Um, and it's a very interesting problem to have. David Miller, of course, is the networking maintainer. He is actually opposed to this patch set, but even he understands why it is that, that people want to do this. A related problem is middle boxes, middle boxes being the routers between you and wherever you're trying to reach on the net. They too can block protocol deployment. If any of you remember the, the problems with explicit congestion notification, another enhancement added 10, 15 years ago, something like that. If you turned it on, you broke your network because various middle boxes out there would simply filter out the packets and not let them pass through. So you couldn't use it. So once again, we had a useful network enhancement that was thwarted by, by the machines in the middle. Middle boxes also have an increasingly unpleasant tendency to, to watch what you're doing, to spy on you, to track, to record, and so on and so forth. One of the nice things about moving your transport protocol into a UDP packet is you can encrypt it so that the network between you and the other end has no idea of who you're talking to, what sort of protocols you're using, or anything like that. So in a sense, what it is doing is it, it's an attempt to return to the end-to-end the -end principle that the internet was designed around in the first place, where all the intelligence is at the endpoints, and the boxes in the middle are simply concerned with moving the packets around and nothing else. It's a nice idea, right, to be able to do this, but as I mentioned, there's some resistance to this. And the resistance comes down to this. Yes, you can ship your own transport layer stack, and you can implement all these nice enhancements that we've had for a while. But nothing limits you to stuff that appears in, in free software and in network RFCs and so on. You can put anything you want in there. And so you can start to create your own proprietary transport level protocols. And um, I suspect most of us don't think that companies out there would resist doing that, right? So we could see something that's moving towards a world where our open and free and highly interoperable net becomes much more proprietary and specific to specific applications and so on. And that, that's not a direction really that, that anybody would like to see the net go. So that, that's why this sort of stuff has, has seen resistance getting into the kernel so far. But I don't think that we're going to be able to resist it because the, the forces behind it are so strong. Because otherwise, we're really stuck with, with you know, last decade's network. And that's, that's a hard problem to get around. The, the Linux kernel has for years been essentially the reference implementation of, of many of the standards that define the net. And has brought a lot of stuff together. We really have to wonder if in the future the kernel is going to continue to be the unifying force that, that drives the network forward in this way. It's, it's something that we're really going to have to watch because uh, we may lose some, a certain amount of control over how the network works.
different sort of problem area, related in a sense. But let's, let's reminisce for a moment. Let's get nostalgic. Remember the good old days of, say, the 2.4 kernel way back when? Back then, we didn't have the development model that we have now. So it took years to get a, a stable kernel released out. From 2.4 to 2.6 was, was three years and some to do that. Right? It's a long, long time to wait for a new kernel, especially in a period where we had huge feature gaps to fill. People were writing new drivers and new kernel features and all that sort of stuff and putting them all in for the 2.6 release. Meanwhile, our stable kernel was 2.4. Everybody wanted all those features, but they weren't available in a stable release. So what happened? The distributors backported a lot of this code into their own versions of, of the 2.4 kernel, threw in a few of their own little features while they were at it. Um, who here remembers the Tux web server? Um, and built into the Red Hat kernel once upon a time. There were some very interesting things and some very strange kernels that were shipped, um, to say the least. And then when 2.6 did come out, all these distributors had a whole lot of fun forward porting all of this stuff again. They had a big mess to deal with. And nobody liked this, so what did we do about it? This We made a couple of changes. One of them was what has been known as the upstream first rule. The idea being that if you were shipping a kernel, you should not be shipping code that is not either in an upstream kernel or at least on some sort of a plausible path towards getting towards being in, in the upstream kernel. And we changed the development model so that instead of waiting years for a new kernel, you wait 10 weeks. So there's a much less time to wait for new stuff to actually get out to a place where people can make use of it. So we did these two things, problem solved, right? Where everything's taken care of and everybody's happy. And for a little while, it kind of seemed that way. And things got a whole lot better. Um, a year or so ago, I bought a new phone. It's, a, it's just a Nexus 5X. It's nothing all that fancy. So if you look at this phone, it's running Android 7. It's an Android NuGet system, bleeding edge software, absolutely new stuff. It's going to have the greatest, newest software that anybody could possibly want because this is the Google flagship phone, right? Sort of thing. It's running a 3.10.73 kernel. And this here bleeding edge phone is. The 3.10 kernel. Um, was released in June of 2013, the better part of four years ago. 3.10.73, that particular update, was released about two years ago. The um, 3.10 kernel is a quarter million patches behind the mainline. Now, how many people here think that an Android release that came out towards the end of last year is not going to want to use anything that was contained in those 250,000 patches that went in since its kernel was released, right? So what are they doing? They're backporting it. So the kernels that are shipped on devices like this are not mainline kernels. They have all kinds of backported stuff in them. Um, so we're kind of back to the old problem of these, these monster backport kernels. So why are they doing this rather than, say, just running the mainline kernel that has all that stuff in it already. Well, there is, of course, the, the usual fear of regressions and bugs, that sort of thing. When you've got a project that's moving as quickly as the kernel, you are going to have regressions and bugs. It's a legitimate fear. Whether it's really a bigger fear than the fear of running a, your own special backported kernel that nobody else has tested but you is, is something that you have to decide. That's the trade-off that they tend to make, is that. But the other aspect of it is this. This is a slide that Tim Bird put up at the Kernel Summit a couple of years ago. He's just listing the amount of out-of-tree code that is shipped in, in various handset kernels. So if you had a, a Galaxy S5 phone, it had 3.1 million lines of out-of-tree code shoved into the kernel that they were shipping. Now, the kernel is approximately 20 million lines of code, plus or minus, something like that. By the time you've configured out everything you don't need on a handset, it's a pretty small fraction of that. So the out-of-tree code probably exceeds the amount of mainline code running in a kernel like this. So this, there's all kinds of weird stuff in there, from backports to proprietary drivers to their own rewrite of the scheduler, all kinds of really weird stuff that's in there. So one of the reasons that they don't go to a newer kernel is that they would have to forward port all of that stuff. And that's not an easy problem. So when they come up with a new handset that maybe needs a couple of new drivers, they simply backport those new drivers in their same old kernel and ship that. And so they remain stuck on it. That's why things like 
mobile devices remain stuck on old kernels because they've got this ball and chain that is really hard for them to carry forward. So you might ask, okay, well, why are they doing this? Well, there's a lot of stuff there, a lot of reasons, including the fact that upstreaming code can take a long time. Um, you might remember the wake locks issue. It took years to get a, a wake locks implementation into the kernel, that sort of thing. We still don't have a proper USB charging implementation. You might, with some work, be able to get a mainline kernel running on a contemporary handset, but not for very long because you can't charge it. Um, so if you are shipping hardware, you can't wait for this, right? You simply cannot wait for, for the kernel community to get around to, to merging something that you have. You have to go ahead and do it. There's just no way around that. And again, some of it is simply not upstreamable at all. If you as a system on chip manufacturer decided that the Linux scheduler isn't for you and you're going to hack up your own, well, fine, you can do that. The license lets you do that, but you're not going to get that upstream, right? Because it's not really going to work for anything but you. And that is the sort of thing that happens. And of course, the, the plague of binary-only drivers that um, have been with us forever and we can never really get rid of. Yeah, and the simple fact is the kernel just moves too slowly for a lot that's going on. Despite our modern development model and all the changes that go in, we're still moving pretty slowly relative to the consumer electronics industry, which has really got a lot going on. Another way of looking at this, if you ask kernel, the kernel community, why aren't you just accepting a lot more of this stuff and getting it upstream so they can run upstream kernels, and they will answer back, well, we've been here for 25 years and some. We expect that we'll still be here 25 years from now, or at least we hope somebody else will be here taking care of this for us in 25 years. Um, don't necessarily want to be doing it ourselves. And um, we have to maintain our, our own standards and keep the kernel maintainable, or the whole thing will collapse under its own weight. And this is absolutely true. The manufacturers respond saying, well, nobody's even going to remember this product next year. Why should we be bothering getting our code upstream? even though their product next year probably is going to want that code and so on. So this is a, a big back and forth. It is, I would argue, perhaps one of our biggest process problems at the moment, the fact that to a great extent, the big part of the industry is not actually running our kernels. So that's, I don't, I don't know entirely how we're going to solve it. Some good things are happening. The, the Nexus 5X actually runs a scheduler that was developed, it's not upstream yet, but it was developed with the idea of enhancing our existing scheduler and going upstream and probably will get there. So some people are actually trying to solve some of these problems, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a long time to get there. So last thing I thought I'd talk about is a simple non-controversial topic, <laughs> um, but it is an area that we have been talking about anyway, and that of course is CopyLeft and the the general public license under which the kernel is shipped. The problem, of course, is that there's a lot of companies out there shipping our software without respecting its license. This has always been a problem. It seems like it's the worst problem. At the moment, there's no end of products out there where, where you simply cannot get the source for the, the kernels that was shipped. So as our community thinks about how do we respond to this, the, the question that comes up often is that of legal action in particular, and do we take some of these companies to court? Because, I mean, a lot of people are getting pretty impatient with this and want to see something done. So you will see arguments made out there that, um, that companies will not comply with the license, at least certain kinds of companies will not comply with our licensing without the threat of consequences if they fail to do so. And this, I think, is an entirely legitimate and true point, right? Companies will behave as companies behave, and they will do what they can get away with. And if there is no cost to noncompliance, whereas compliance itself is often fairly expensive, then yeah, they will, they will do that. Um, say that lawsuits have yielded useful code contributions in the past, and it's something that we want to do again. They often report, will refer to the WRT router suits in particular as having brought in some very useful code and started off the whole um, router distribution area with, with that. And they say that if we don't enforce our license, then what we have is effectively a permissively licensed kernel. And that is not what we set out to create when we put release our code under the GPL. So uh, these are all, I think, fairly strong points. And they're, they're points that a lot of people are making. 
there are points to the other side that are worth considering as well, which is why this is not the, the simplest of, of debates here. Perhaps the strongest of these being that once you file legal action against a company, that company, which may have been trying to get a little bit better in dealing with our community, which may in particular have people inside it who understand the problem and are trying to make the company work better, that company will shut down, will lock down, and will stop talking to you, right? When you file a suit against a company, chances are you've lost that company in the free software community for, for some years at least. Um, going to court is never a certain thing to do. Right? You never quite know what you're going to get, and sometimes you get some pretty unpleasant surprises. People who are critical of, of this approach will say that we've, in fact, gotten very useful, very little useful code through legal action over the years. They will often point to the, the busy box suits in particular, which a lot of people see as having yielded no useful code at all while having effectively killed the, the busy box project by driving companies away from it towards, towards other things. Um, so the argument here is that it's a whole lot better to work with engineers and to um, change companies with, from within. I think actually nobody would disagree that it's better to do it that way. Um, it's, it's more a matter of when you give up on that, I suppose. And some people s seem to feel that you should never give up on companies. That you, you get there eventually if you wear them down. Because we've had some pretty good success with companies that were once very badly out of compliance are now in compliance. And, um, we did it without lawsuits. So I haven't put up a slide like this for a while because it's kind of old news, but it's worth repeating that in the kernel community, something on the order of 90% of our code, if not more, comes from companies, right? Without these companies participating in our community, we would not have the kernel that we have now. It simply wouldn't be there, right? So. If you think that filing legal action risks killing this particular goose that's laying all these golden eggs, then you're going to be very reluctant to do that. And so that's why there is some strong resistance to, to legal action in parts of our community. Um, another way of looking at this, perhaps, and explain some of the disconnect, people who are agitating for stronger action are often trying to get the code for devices that exist now, because perhaps the vendor has abandoned them and they have security problems, they want to fix them, or people just want to enhance them, that sort of thing. Um, that's what you try to get through legal action. It's the code for something that's already been shipped because that's what the compliance issue is. People who say, let's take a different, more conciliatory approach, are looking for a stream of code coming from these companies indefinitely into the future. And so they, they value that differently. So again, it goes back and forth, there's a lot of, um, a lot of argumentation there. I don't know how we're going to resolve all of this, but, um, but in the end, we, we all have the same goal, which is to ensure the, the ongoing success of Linux and the free software community. We've figured it out this far. I think we will continue to figure it out into the future, but, but there are, are not simple solutions there. So with that, um, I'm done. I think there's maybe a minute or two for questions if people have them, and I thank you all for your attention. Thank you, John. We do have a few minutes for questions, so raise your hand. Do you think we might be, as a kernel community, focusing on the wrong set of companies where we're blaming end device vendors where it's really one up the stack in terms of BSP vendors and chipset vendors? So often the problem is indeed with the, the SOC vendors and that sort of thing. It's, it's through the entire chain which is why some of the compliance efforts out there, some of the stuff the Linux Foundation is doing, for example, is trying to, to certify every step in the chain so that you have a manifest that comes with the software and you can, you can demonstrate this compliance if you are interested in doing so. Um, the problem is that the, you know, if you're trying to find somebody to approach with legal action, you have to approach the, the people at the end of the chain because those are the ones that you have access to. You often don't even know who the others are and that sort of thing. So that, that tends to be where that piece of, that, of the, the focus is. And then it's up to them to, to ensure that their suppliers are compliant. 
Um, but yes, often the problem is not the, the final step, but, but further up the chain. Mark. So you mentioned uh, every time you have a X number of people being first time contributors. Um, what would be interesting is knowing how many actually are just one time as opposed to first time contributors and how many come back. I, I agree. In fact, I have in the past put up plots that included the number of last time contributors because you can look at that and see. The problem is that those, it tends to be really deceptive because even five years later, you'll find people who suddenly come back and start contributing again. So you never really know when somebody is done contributing. So I stopped putting those up because you have to look back like 10 years to get into something that's even remotely um, useful, I think. And by that time, it's not useful anymore. So yeah, that, that's a hard question to, to answer. There are, there are yeah, and there, there are a lot of drive-by one-time people. Maybe a third to a half, typically, um, would be my guess. But it's, it's hard to know for sure. Good day. Um, I was looking, <clears throat> looking at the problem of the, you know, the kernel move, is the kernel community moving very slowly, or is the, are we moving you know, at the wrong pace? I was wondering, is, is the possibility that we're using the wrong sort of set of tools to manage the code so that, sh you know, should we be looking at tools that can make it easier for people to keep patch sets up to date and thus lessen their burden and then and thus make it more, you know, easier for them to look at moving upstream? Well, there, there is certainly interest in, in improved tooling. You know, there is, for example, Josh Triplett has a thing called Git Series that is aimed at doing just that sort of thing. Um, so there, you know, there is tooling out there and people working on it. And yeah, certainly the tools could use improvement. Uh, anytime we do improve our tools, we improve our process as a whole. Anybody else? Is there any divide between kernels that are made for small devices and ones for big? Sorry, so I didn't quite catch that. Is there any... So is there becoming a divide between kernels that are targeted at small devices, like phones, and ones that are targeted at big machines? A, a divide between kernels on small and big machines? Well, you know, in a sense that the small devices tend to ship something that's pretty far from mainline, yes. Um, you know, we do try very hard in the community to have the same kernel work for everybody. So, you know, to a great extent, it is the same kernel, but certainly different use cases have different needs. And in terms of what you're actually being shipped, yeah, there is, there is a divide with the small end right now. That I mean, is what I was talking about before. It was a problem that I would like to see fixed. Uh, does that answer your question? I think we have time for one more brief question. Not so much a question, it's just um, a mention of LTSI and LTS kernels. They're often what are used in small systems. And so it's not necessarily a matter of not using mainline, it's a matter of uh, because of the way embedded systems are put together, they tend to use the long-term support embedded kernels. So just wanted to add that to your Yeah, your they answer. do use the LTSI kernels, which contain a lot of those backports and so on, are, are focused on trying to centralize that effort and get a bunch of the stuff upstream eventually. So yeah, there are initiatives to improve things. Okay, and thank you so much for um, speaking today, John. We appreciate it. Right. If you have more questions, you can probably track them down in the hallway at some point. Okay. So thanks a bunch. Please join me in thanking him. Right. Thank you.